Pictures. Basically, the way uh, the future of the image works is that there's a lot of thinking involved. And when there's a lot of thinking and discussion involved, there's also a certain consensus involved. Consensus always necessarily means compromise, and compromise means there's a certain reduction of outcome. Um, there is a limitation, and this is why I end my sentence with long de deliberations on vegetation. This is just for as an example. In an image, require a degree in biology in order to be able to settle them properly, but are actually settled with a shortcut, which is Wikipedia or Google or anything that looks similar to the idea that we would actually, uh, of which we would like to make a picture out. So the era of dark optics means that we lose mutual authentication. We lose this system of the camera, where, which actually I would say was, if one could say of a technology that it had a political preference, we would say that photography was liberal. It was open to anything. It was open to any light that would enter Go, come through the lens and would graciously descend upon the surface which would then react chemically and be fixated. So there was a, there's a liberal openness to the invention of photography. In dark optics we lose uh, this uh, system of originality, of having been in front of something. We no longer to produce an image require an apparatus, a specific time or a specific place or a film that has a specific speed. Suddenly, and this is a little bit mysterious, I realize this, but I will speak later again about the tableau. The tableau and the relation to the painting sound familiar again. So we actually, with the new debate on dark optics, we go back to the period before the invention of photography. In fact, we return to the 19th century. I'm not sure if what I'm saying is true, but it's a sense that I have in my little finger here that there is something of it. However, in 1839, the invention was read in the reverse order. There was, a, of course, an immediate uh, struggle or competition or uncomfortable feeling with how do we relate to painting from now on in 1839, but we are reading this the reverse order. We are moving back to a system of the tableau and moving away from the liberal system of anything can land on this surface which is vacant and is open to anything. This forces us to admit that all along during the entire existence of uh, analog photography, let's, uh, to use a cliche, let's just call it like that for a while, authenticity required confidence. And it would be a mistake to say that originality or the truth system was dependent on a material such as the polyester or the celluloid uh, or the lens or the apparatus of the camera. Um, but it was actually what it did. It developed a system or uh, an, an agreement, a collective agreement that what would come out of this camera would be uh, part of a truth of having been there, having been there somewhere, somewhere in time, and therefore necessarily was familiar to anyone who would see it. So I continue saying that just like one would find reinsurance in the word of a member of one's own community, a mother or, of a, or a brother. With that I mean simply that um, the history of analog photography is a history of confidence, of being able to outsource truth to a device. And that in turn generated a speed of communication and a language which I think Gabor already referred to Willem Flusser, where Flusser um, beautifully explains this, the speed of the language of images as in relation to linear writing where uh, image culture becomes the weapon of the proletariat or the non-literate uh, in um, gaining a language that would in the end outrun the speed of linear writing and would become the dominant system 
of all aspects of life, uh, including politics and uh, you name it. So in dark optics, the key word becomes confidence or the loss of confidence. And <clears throat> so fortunately, we are recording this talk, so maybe you have the chance of, you don't have to follow everything I say or understand, but there's a possibility to reread everything or to rerun uh, the conf uh, conversation. The key word becomes confidence. And in dark optics, <clears throat> we have to admit that confidence is gone. There is talk about um, this uh, new, I'm always surprised that there's, uh, people are actually uh, amazed by this. The, uh, it's called deep fake, I believe, where synthesized uh, combined images um, are being um, connected to a voice which is not the voice of a person. But you could imagine Barack Obama saying something of like, go fuck yourself. And he would have the end of a presidency um, announced because of that. So deep fake is uh, just one example of a many um, announcing a certain, a, a renewed, I would say, distrust in the camera and in the whole system, truth system, that the camera represents. However, I claim that maybe this truth system gets a few punches, but we can't really say goodbye to it. It's simply in our DNA nowadays to communicate through uh, that system of automated images which we call photographs and film and video, etc., for the fundamentalists among us and slowly but certainly we find ourselves in a, in a comparison which is uncomfortable is that we have to admit that perception perception cannot be outsourced to the camera it cannot be outsourced to the photograph um, that we still are always at risk of becoming mad when we have to or when our confidence or our ideas of truth are being destroyed. This is what happens in trauma, in a child that sees both parents deported and turns mad from one moment to the other. But there, we have to admit that actually madness, or folie, um, uh, to say it with Michel Foucault, um, is part of perception, and that there is always a thin line um, of uh, in which confidence may be gone and we find we have lost grip on the order of objects that surround us. Perception at that point becomes synonymous to panic. My claim is that collectively this is what's happening uh, to image culture, is that there is a lot of reinvestigation on um, is what we are seeing, does it have any does it have any any other meaning than what it wants to tell us? Um, slowly but certainly, there's this sense that any image is a message directed specifically at someone and is not this um, liberal thing that has landed once upon a time in the lens of a camera and then hit, uh, hit the, dark, uh, the, uh, the body of the camera and was captured. The, the, the idea of capturing just goes away altogether. What we are talking about now is the idea of producing. And when we are producing, we are not only producing an image, we are producing a thought. So what remains is the panic. The confidence may be gone. We think we see, but we are of course unaware of seeing. And this is the definition of a fool, is that the fool will, uh, will suppose that everybody around him is observing the same uh, things he's seeing. So what we're left with is panic. Then I have a number of ideas which I, uh, there I wrote uh, remarks to be elaborated. Um, and I've actually already said the first one, the lens image can be credited for having established a lightning fast language of images that could outrun linear writing. The problem with linear writing was that it wrote history, but it wrote it very slowly. So the illiterate, in the end, won. And, uh, well, today images predict more or less uh, anything. 
and thus outrun the writing of history altogether. Photography continues to perform this task, albeit as a ritual. So the ritual continues to be practiced. Photography does not disappear. On the contrary, um, everyone became a photographer even after it has been swallowed back in by linear writing. And I know this is a difficult one, to be swallowed in by linear writing, but I suspect there is a competition between information and photography. It's a, a competition, and I would say information, these are the old powers of the feudal powers that um, were uh, in, in, in power before the invention of photography before this uh, incredible revolution that uh, signified photography, uh, which really was a system of checks and balances. Without photography, there would long have been a third world war and I, we probably wouldn't be sitting here. So it was that important. <coughs> the alphabet is reformulated as a non-binary data string. I will not uh, go into that too much, first of all, because I haven't really figured out what I want to say with that. Uh, secondly, um, it, it will take another half an hour before we get anywhere. And then what digital does is it eats everything. This is probably the best definition that you can give on digital. To continue with the remarks on dark optics, <clears throat> there is another thing which is probably as complicated to talk about as the relation between the word and the image in dark optics, which is the role of Cartesian space in 3D uh, images. Just go back to analog photography. You have, what you have is a system of hope because you're always taking an image with light. As long as you have got light coming into your lens, uh, there is an image. So you always have, in fact, you have a device that is structurally is a hopeful thing. It is always uh, dependent on light. In dark optics, this is no longer the case. What you have are images which are produced out of coordinates. So we are speaking about uh, uh, Euclidean space, the three uh, axes out of which you need a position for uh, any line um, or any uh, uh, particle uh, to be defined in space. The worrying part of it is that this Cartesian space, which is, just imagine for a moment, the perspective which is at infinitum and ends, uh, let's say, in uh, probably in heavens or in a horizon which is unimaginable. So we have a clearly defined space and we have a coordinate somewhere in it and that is where um, the new image situates any subject it will depict. That means that even if you are in 3D space, you are entirely imprisoned. Everything is predetermined. Every image, although it may pretend to be liberated, like um, analog photography would have been, it is not. What it does, it emulates the same liberty, and we find ourselves with glasses, uh, 3D glasses, we look around us and we have a sense of immersion into a space, but the space is completely predefined. The Cartesian space is something of which I've always had a, a profound distrust. Um, as it uh, implies the eye of God. And I think, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this is Gilles Deleuze that refers very beautifully, like only the French can, to the Cartesian space as le point de vue de deux. Sorry, I always make this mistake. Le point de vue de Dieu, which is the cube and the view at infinitum, uh, the perspective point which then disappears into, uh, into an abyss of invisibility, which is the point of view of God. And it's changed into the binary system, which is le point de vue de deux. This is again something that you couldn't easily translate into another language, only the French can do it. When Deleuze speaks about le point de vue de deux, he speaks about um, the geometry of Leibniz and uh, the changes during uh, the Baroque uh, in the point de vue de Dieu that 
changes into the binary system, which is now finally becoming the dominant system of computing. So what we have here is an opposition between the binary system and linear perspective. It resembles le point de vue de deux and le point de vue de Dieu. Don't try to understand everything, even